Hello and welcome to CNC World, broadcasting from North America and around the globe. I'm Xie He in Washington. Joining me today in our studio is Paolo von Chirac, the president of Global Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us, sir. Pleasure. So on Thursday night, U.S. President Donald Trump instructed officials to consider additional tariffs on $100 billion of worth of Chinese goods. This came after China announced its countermeasures to impose tariffs on 106 U.S. products, including soybeans, automobiles, and aircraft parts. So this latest statement, sir, uh, do you think it's another unpredictable, surprising move by President Trump? Well, he certainly keeps surprising us, right? Exactly. Even when he announced the very, very early round of all this, which is the, what was the aluminum and, uh, and steel yeah. uh, import tariffs, uh, uh, which came in stages. The first this is for everybody, then certain countries were excluded, and then it turned out it was really targeting China. Even though if we, you know, for, for all of us to understand, America doesn't even import that much in terms of aluminum and steel from China. Its major you know, suppliers are Canada and South Korea and other countries. But so be that as it may, it looks like uh, that there is an attempt to ratchet up uh, the, the tensions. I guess, but, I, the, but this is only a guess, because with Mr. Trump, we don't have clear indicators of how he proceeds and, and, and who is actually listening to that this become like bargaining chips, mm -hmm. meaning I want to show you that I'm serious, that I really mean this, and I want to negotiate. Now, uh, of course, China uh, is not going to just uh, roll over and take it, uh, as any other country would do, says, okay, you do this to me, I do the same to you. Uh, and, and oddly enough, Mr. Trump said, oh, China wasn't right to retaliate. Well, you know, it's really strange because if there, is a, if there are tariffs on the American side, it's, not, it's only natural to expect a counter move on the part of China. Now, the question is, with this additional round annou just announced, which is bigger, what does this mean? Are we, is this kind of an all-out trade war? Uh, like, you know, in my opinion, and I'm not the only one to say this, uh, nobody wins here. Nobody wins. And so I, I hope that there is an end game, which is about uh, sitting down and uh, having an adult conversation about the matters that need to be addressed. And um, Trump said uh, what he wants is to try to help protect uh, American manufacturers. So do you think these tariffs measures will benefit U.S. manufacturers? Well, again, it, it depends who and where. Uh, let's go back to you know, steel and aluminum. If you are in the steel business in the United States, well, you think, oh, that's good news because we, are, we don't feel now this pressure anymore from imported goods. But the steel manufacturing base in the United States is very small. It used to be huge once upon a time. You know, Pittsburgh used to be the, you know, the steel manufacturing city in the, in the world about 100 years ago. Though You go today to Pittsburgh, there's nothing. You know, they, they do you know, healthcare devices and education and other things. There's no steel left. So what I'm trying to say is if you are, if you are, if you belong to the sectors that are being protected, you benefit, but everybody else does not. If you are, if you're using uh, semi-finished aluminum and uh, steel products to, as inputs in your own production in the U.S., your prices go up because, you know, because of the tariffs. And so eventually the consumer gets hit by higher prices. So I would say while you benefit a small sector of the economy, you put at a disadvantage a larger sector of the economy. So I don't really think that this pays off. However, emotionally and politically, it may help Mr. Trump because his political base is among people who have suffered or who believe that they've, been, they've suffered because of the closing down of large manufacturing enterprises. But this is a phenomenon that goes, you know, back 20 years, you know, then it's progressive. But, but, but Mr. Trump said to them, if, if you elect me president, I'm going to bring manufacturing back to the United States and you'll get your old jobs back, which is a bit of a stretch. And we found something interesting is about um, Mr. Trump. He said in March that um, trade wars good and easy to win. And then he said in April that 
uh, U.S. is not in a trade war with China, a trade war uh, was long lost before. And then yeah. he proposed these, uh, these tariffs on China. So what he did and what he said is a little bit contradictory, right? It's a bit unclear, indeed. And again, just a very statement to say that trade wars are good and easy to win. It's contradicted by the historic experience. Uh, even if we go back to the Great Depression here in the United States, when at the time, and people didn't quite understand the implications, but it was believed since there was a large you know, unemployment in America that the Smoot-Hawley tariff would help American enterprises by blocking uh, foreign imports and therefore potentially propping up American employment. It was a disaster. Everybody knows that this was a disaster, and there's plenty of historic evidence because it simply led to, you know, uh, retaliations from the Europeans, from the Canadians, from everybody, and so it ended up bringing, you know, international trade to a standstill. Other more limited efforts in uh, in the um, uh, tariff imposition have not really produced great results. This is done before, during the Reagan administration, and in smaller measures during the Bush administration, etc. But in, in reality, I don't think that anybody can conclude that this is beneficial. And so, uh, to say trade wars are uh, good and easy to win, it's a bit of a strange statement. So, Mr. Trump's rem uh, uh, his remarks like, um, uh, and his moves like, building the border wall with Mexico and his America first policy, all these, uh, how do you think it will impact the country in the future? Well, look, there are some, th uh, let's, it's hard to put all this together, uh, but you know, there are some good things uh, that uh, the Trump administration has done, in my opinion, but those are really have not much to do with uh, tra foreign trade. And this has to do mostly with a deregulation of American businesses that have been, you know, kind of suffocated by the stranglehold of, of many regulations, environmental regulations, safety regulations, you know, medical regulations, all kinds of things, some of which, of course, are legitimate because, you, you know, the government has to be concerned with public safety, right, in the workplace and, and, and for the consumer in general. But uh, there was too much of that. So the fact that Mr. Trump has announced and implemented his administration, a lot of deregulation, I think that's good for America, good for the economy, and quite frankly, good for the world, because that also makes America a more interesting destination for foreign investments, so, you know, revitalizes the economy, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, uh, but the idea that it's possible to resurrect old manufacturing sectors that have kind of died away for a variety of reasons, for global, because of globalization, because of automation in many instances, that's kind of a dream. It's not going to happen. And the idea that we need a, you know, a, a wall you know, with Mexico, well, look, that's, a, that's also a symbolic thing. Does America have the right, as any other country, to have safe borders? Absolutely. There's nothing. Who would challenge that? You know, you want to know who comes in and who, who goes out, and that it's all done according to law. That's legitimate. But the idea that you need a wall, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit strange. And we also know that given the geography in the, of the border area between the United States and Mexico, in some parts are huge mountains. It's physically impossible to build a wall there. So how is this going to play out? It's not, it's not clear. Um, you know, I, f I fully appreciate that the president, as any president uh, uh, should, is, uh, would like to take care of the welfare of the American people and to create the best possible economic environment for growth and prosperity for everybody. You know, that's a, that's a legitimate goal. But to, but to believe that uh, if there is a trade imbalance with any country, and of course our trade imbalance with China is huge, uh, that's immediately an indication that the other side is not playing fair. Well, that's a bit of a strange uh, um, a theory that many economists, quite frankly, even here in the United States, uh, challenge. Um, let's say if this escalates, many people would worry that it'll affect their daily life, their yes. everyday uh, ne uh, necessities, the price <laughs> will go up. So uh, in the worst case, what will it uh, affect the global trade and global economy? 
I, it's hard to say because, you know, there can be ripple effects that go beyond the bilateral relationship between the United States and China. But, but since these are the two largest protagonists in the world economy, and so I imagine that if there are strong repercussions uh, due to this, uh, you know, how can I say, rising tensions between the United States and China, these countries likely will be affected too. And so, and, and certainly at some point, the American consumer will feel the uh, impact of, uh, uh, of higher prices and some um, sectors of the economy that rely fairly heavily on China as an export market, soybeans, pork, you know, we, some of these uh, uh, aircraft parts and what have you, uh, they, will, they, will hurt, they will be hurt. Now, how deeply will they be hurt? I don't know. You know, is it going to be? Is it going to be? Will this generate uh, unemployment? Uh, will there be really serious repercussions? Well, I think it depends largely on uh, how many more sectors are we adding into this fight, and how long this is going to go on for. I I find it difficult to believe that something like this can go on, say for 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 six months or a year or something. I mean, I would find it shocking if if a year from now. We were having this the same, com the, same sem the same conversation. That would be bad news, <laughs> really bad news. I really hope that, as I said, that cooler heads and common sense will prevail, and that both sides will find a way to reach some kind of an agreement that is uh, uh, fair, and where everybody, nobody loses face, and everybody feels treated honorably. Uh, so, do you think the U.S. will step up first, next, and um, propose a negotiation? Well, look, it all depends what Mr. Trump negotiating tactic is. Let's not forget, I mean, this has been said many times, and I'm not sure if this is entirely true. He comes from the real estate business. He's a developer. And in, and in, and in these kinds of negotiations, sometimes people make outlandish, you know, uh, opening gambits. And they say, oh, this property, oh, you say it's worth uh, $2 billion? Well, I'll give you $200 million. I have, oh, it's impossible. Then, then you say, okay, well, maybe I can double that. You know, how's that? You know, in other words, to make outlandish claims and to threaten to walk out, um, uh, um, it's not uncommon in that business world. But, uh, but this is different. You are dealing with governments. This is a different situation. It, I, as I said, it wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if, at the same time as the White House or the United States. Uh, trade representative makes uh, this uh, new announcement of tariffs and whatnot, behind the scenes, there's already some kind of an opening, you know, uh, proposal for Beijing mm -hmm. to discuss with, uh, with maybe unofficially, you know, not in front of the cameras, with American representatives. I think it would make perfect sense that, th that this would happen. I'm not sure if this is Mr. Trump's, you know, President Trump's uh, game plan. But I would like to think that, as I said, you know, he's got some good advisors, uh, including Larry Kudlow, who is a, certainly not a protectionist and a person who advocates, uh, you know, classical sort of liberal economics and open markets, that he may make his wo voice heard. He just started on the job, so to speak, as a econ key, you know, economic advisor at the White House uh, that would... Um, um, provide that kind of input to say, okay, Mr. President, you made your point. Let's, uh, let's sit down and talk. Yes, let's hope for the best. Thank Indeed. you for your time, sir. Thank you. And that is all for our special report today. Stay tuned on CNC World for more of the latest news here in the U.S. and around the globe. I'm Shio in Washington. Bye for now.